everybody here this morning. What a beautiful weekend we're having. As we're singing this song and thinking about letting the glory of the Lord rise among us. And I was thinking the joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen? Amen. That's what we have. We know that the devil's already been defeated and all his minions because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And we're going to celebrate that today during communion and remember that. Everything the Lord has done for us, it's available for every person. If there's somebody here that hasn't made a commitment and yielded to the Holy Spirit, yielded to the Lord and accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, he's available. He loves you more than you could possibly know. So we just want a, people to be blessed this morning. We don't want one person to leave here without being touched by the Lord and his Holy Spirit because there's every soul here is important to the Lord. He would have died for any one person. So we're just so grateful for what the Lord has for us, and he helps us through so many things. And the last couple of weeks, we've been like on a roller coaster ride because my brother passed away, my younger brother passed away a couple of weeks ago, and then two days later, my wife had a surprise birthday party for me, and so it's just like one thing, and then we went on vacation, and, and we normally do work vacations. We travel all around the country. For, for my art shows, but this time we were, thought we we're gonna have some fun, so we went and saw the Ark, Noah's Ark down in Kentucky, and what a blessing just to see what the Lord has allowed these people to do to build that magnificent, it was like walking into the Viking Stadium. I was like a little kid <laughs> running through there and, and uh, just to have a great time with Lori and just to have a great time down there, and we were at the Creation Museum you know, God is moving, and it's so neat to see how he can move through people to have something that vast and that magnificent built. So I encourage anybody that you have not gone down there to go down there and see that. It's just a faith builder. Uh, it just makes you love the word of God even more. He has so many great things for us. And you see how he rescued the people when the flood came. And, you know, the Bible says, as in the days of Noah, so will be in, uh, now in the coming of Jesus, where things are really dark. It was really dark back then. Only seven people were saved, and, or eight. That's good, Lori. Uh, I was just testing you. <laughs> Thank God for our wives, eight. So praise the Lord for that. Yeah, so... Um, you know, that's, uh, it, it, so it, was, it, it really touched us, and we're so thankful. Um, so the Lord brings us through all of our trials, and he, he encourages us and restores us. And I just wanted to share out of Isaiah 41.10. It was the new one I added this week in my prayer and memorization journal for Bible verses. And, and it's, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And that is a promise. So just believe on that. Would you please stand and we will open in prayer this morning. And before I pray, I want to welcome everybody online. Thank you so much for joining us. You're important to us. We pray for blessings on you and pray that you'll really feel a part of our entire service this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for all you've done. We thank you, Lord, most of all for your son, Jesus Christ, who suffered, who was humiliated, who was mocked and beat upon. We thank you, Lord, that you took all of that because of our ugly sin that we put on you, Lord. We, we thank you, Lord God, that you've redeemed us Thank you, Lord, that you filled us with your Holy Spirit, that we can walk in the Spirit and bear fruit for your kingdom. We lift up each person this morning that's listening online and those that are here, Lord God, that you touch them in a special way. Pray that they would feel your love, Lord, the power that you have to give them encouragement and hope. For your word says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and we pray, Lord, that that would happen in us, Lord, that you would fill us with your joy and your peace and your strength. We thank you, Lord, for all you've provided for us. And help us to think on good things, Lord. We pray for those who are he uh, hurting physically, emotionally, and spiritually, Lord God, that you would touch them. 
We praise you, Heavenly Father. Thank you so much. And we pray these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Grateful that you're here, uh, both here in person and uh, thanks for joining us online. Happy, happy, happy Fourth of July weekend as we have the privilege of celebrating um, not only the, wow, look at that. How about our tech team? Um, not only have the privilege of celebrating uh, freedom and our nation over these past 246 years, but celebrating our freedom in Christ as well as we gather this morning. I encourage you to fill out a connection card that's in your bulletin, drop it off in the offering plate on the way out. Connections matter, we love you, we care, and uh, we wanna help and be there for you in any way uh, that we can. Well, we're gonna be blessed uh, here in a moment uh, by some very, very gifted uh, musicians. Um, and uh, before that, I'm gonna pray, uh, but before that, I'm gonna dismiss the kids for Children's Church and uh, you'll have the opportunity to go down with Julie Christensen, wonderful teacher. She's a high school French teacher by trade. And so bonjour to all of you. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> God bless. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the fact that you've given it to us, you've made it, so we rejoice and are glad in it. Uh, we're grateful to live in the country that you have uh, given to us. Thank you for the freedom that we enjoy that can so often be taken for granted. Thank you for all of those who sacrificed and served and laid it down so uh, that uh, our freedom might be available to us. And we know, and it's uh, certainly shown at the cross, that freedom is not free. So even as we celebrate in our nation, uh, we celebrate as believers in Christ. And as we partake of the communion elements a little bit later in the morning, uh, we recognize that it is Christ who's paid the price for our freedom. Freedom from the penalty and power and ultimately the presence of sin, freedom from death and hell and all of these things that were previously victorious over us, but no more because the victory is ours in Christ. Thank you for your church. Thank you for this body. Thank you for their love for you and for one another. Thank you for our guests who are here today. I pray that they would be made to feel special and that you would meet them and encourage them and challenge them and uh, lift them up today. Lord, help us to be mindful uh, of the needs that we see around us. Help us to not just say, uh, we'll pray for you, but Lord, help us to actually mean it. And sometimes in those times when you move us, where, where we can be the answer to our own prayer and we can come alongside and help meet the needs of the weary travelers alongside of us. Thank you for uh, your truth. In the midst of all that is so, so slippery and so unstable today, we thank you that we can celebrate as a nation and as the church of Jesus Christ that your truth is marching on. We bless you, we honor you, we praise you today in your house because you are worthy and more than worthy of these things. I pray in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. amen. There's no reference to the Civil War. There's no reference to the North and the South. It's all uh, based on scripture. Uh, in 1853, William Steffi wrote a hymn called Canaan's Happy Shore. It uh, uh, came into disuse, but the melody continued as uh, sailors and uh, drinkers or whoever changed the words. <laughs> made it not uh, to what William Steffi wanted. He wanted it to glorify God. But then a man named Thomas Bishop 
joined the Massachusetts Infantry Battalion stationed at Fort Ward at Boston Harbor. And at that time, John Brown made his famous attack at Harper's Ferry. So Thomas Bishop wrote a marching song named John's Brown, John Brown's Body, using the melody. So here you had a Southern Christian writing the hymn with the melody, and then a Northerner uh, writing new words. Uh, but the same thing happened. It's got, the words got changed, and as it wasn't sung as much. Uh, then an anti-slavery activist, uh, Julia, Ward, Howe, Julia Ward Howe, was invited by President Abraham Lincoln to participate in a commission to look at the treatment of Union soldiers. After a day of visiting the camps, she heard the filthy language of the soldiers' marching song and said, why should they go off to die with those words on their lips? that there should be something better. She went to bed as usual that night, but awoke early and a feeling of discouragement came over her as she thought of the women whose sons and husbands were fighting and of those who were languishing in the prisons. Suddenly her concerns were stilled as the lines of a poem began arranging in her mind. When the last verse was finished in her thoughts, she arose and quickly wrote them down. Throughout the war, those words were uh, uh, put to the music of the earlier song, uh, became an encouragement to the soldiers as they, that became their marching song, song through the rest of the war, and it was Abraham Lincoln's favorite hymn. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. His truth is marching on. <coughs>
you very, very much. Well, I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles, if you would please, to the book of Acts, chapter 9. Uh, we found ourself, uh, ourselves in the book of Acts over these recent weeks as we continue in our summer series that we've called The Daring Dozen. Uh, and we have been and will continue to look at 12 profiles of first century New Testament courage to inspire our 21st century faith. A few weeks back, we looked at Barnabas, the son of encouragement who stuck his neck out. And then we looked at Stephen, the first uh, Christian martyr. Last week, Philip, uh, the evangelist, the first Christian missionary. And this morning, uh, an unsung hero of the New Testament, a wonderful woman in the Bible named Tabitha. And we find her story in Acts chapter 9. And I will read from verse 36 through verse 42. Acts chapter 9 verse 36 to 42, and I will read, and you can follow, and I will ask that in honor to God and to his word that we stand together as I read, if you're able. Acts chapter 9 and verse 36. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which when translated is Dorcas, who was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they, went, uh, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called the believers and the widows and presented her to them alive. Verse 42. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. May God have his blessing to the reading of his word. Please be seated. So your entire day has been a disaster. People have disappointed you. Nothing has gone right. Everything that seems like could go wrong has gone wrong. We've spun our wheels and, and feel like we've gotten nowhere. Our, her, our whole world just seems like a giant bummer. But then somebody drops by with a smile as clear as the sun shining through a clean window. Despite their own struggles, they're always there for you. This person in your life seems like they're always up. You know, show them a pile of garbage and they'll discuss the value of flies. Uh, on a rainy day, they talk about the relief that their garden will get. We've all met people like that. In a nutshell, we've just described Tabitha. Herod is remembered in the scripture for his cruelty. Judas Iscariot is remembered for his betrayal. Tabitha survives in our memory. If she hasn't up until now, she will after this morning. Because she was never afraid to be kind and giving. Tabitha was like a dogwood tree in May. We used to live in, before we moved here, in the city of Lombard, Illinois, known as the Lilac Village. Lilacs in May would just fill the air with its beautiful scent. There was just such... Uh, a refreshing sense to it all. And that's how she was. I love how one commentator put it when he said that she was a refreshing person who cared, carried with her the fragrance of hope. I mean, you just knew that if there are people like that around, there was always some bright prospect of hope for tomorrow. 
Other than her devotion to God and to mankind, we know very little about Tabitha. Seven verses cover her whole life in Scripture, and we've just read them. We, we know that uh, Tabitha lived in Joppa, the first part of verse 46. That's modern-day Tel Aviv. It was an important harbor city uh, that... Uh, sits 125 feet above sea level, overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, Joppa was the town and other places in Scripture uh, into which the cedars of Lebanon had, had floated when they were shipped to Jerusalem and used in the construction of the temple. The prophet Jonah left the port of Joppa on his infamous trip where he tried to run away from the call of God on his life. So she was from Joppa. Secondly, we know she was a Christian. In verse 36, she's called a disciple. By the way, the only time in the New Testament that the feminine form of that word disciple is used and it's attributed to her. She's a Christian, but we don't know uh, when uh, she became one or how. We know that she's called Tabitha, which is also translated Dorcas. Tabitha in the Hebrew Dorcas in the Greek, so her Greek friends called her Dorcas, but her Hebrew friends called her Tabitha. Both of them mean gazelle. And how fitting that the most graceful of women would receive a name connected with the most graceful of animals. We see three things about her, and uh, you'll find these in your notes that are inside your bulletin. Uh, we find her deeds, her death, and her deliverance. Her deeds, her death, her deliverance. Uh, first of all, her deeds. Uh, we see that in the last part of verse 36 and the second part of verse 39. Now, there's, there's no reason to believe that Tabitha ever read the book of James. The book of the Bible that we've come to hold so dear that, that talks about faith in action. There's no reason to believe that she ever read the book of James, but she lived it. Her favorite verse may have been James 2, 17, that says, In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. In verse 36, the middle of it, it says that she was always doing good and helping the poor. And then more specifically, in the middle of verse 39, it says that all the widows stood around him, uh, Peter, uh, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Always doing good and helping the poor. Tabitha was like the, the Mother Teresa of her day, except with better theology. Tabitha had taught her friends a valuable lesson. When you love someone, you do something to demonstrate it. Words are nice, and they're essential for good communication, but love requires action. Action is love with hands and feet. You know, it's interesting to see how Jesus handled the need for love in his own life. He wanted to receive love. On several occasions, you remember, he asked his friends if they loved him. Probably the most, most well-known of those uh, occurrences was in John 21, where he asked Peter three times, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? And sometimes I think, you know, why did he really care? He was the Son of God. Jesus had intimate fellowship with the Father God of the universe. I mean, what does it really matter to him if a handful of fishermen loved him? The Christ understood the need for love because he was a full personality. He was fully human. And since he was capable of giving love, he's also capable of receiving it. It's also helpful for us to see Jesus' definition of love. If his friends loved him, they would do what pleased him. Mention that in John chapter 14, verse 21 and 23. If you love me, you will do what I command. If they didn't love Christ, they would ignore him. Love has hands and love has feet. Love does. Perhaps that's why the King James translation 
Uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, which we know as the great love chapter, rendered the word love as charity. Charity meant to do something. Love which is sterile is love that is incomplete. Love that is mature does something for the person that you love. Christ understood this. Tabitha understood this. Tabitha's friends were now grabbing hold of this reality. I think it was particularly appropriate to see widows there in that room. Throughout Christ's ministry in the early church, widows held a special place in the hearts of Christians, and they should still today. Christ came to their defense early on when he condemned the Pharisees, the religious leaders, hypocrites of the day, for taking advantage of them. Widows were vulnerable. The men of that day were better trained in trade and commerce. If a widow had no close relatives to help protect her, she could easily be cheated. And evidently, they were swindling widows out of their money in the name of God and of charity. The, the, the Hebrew people always had a special protection for their widows. They considered God to be their particular guardian. And when they asked, how do you tell a righteous man the answer was easy in Psalm 146, 9. A righteous person cares for the widows. When James in the New Testament asked for the definition of true religion, the answer was easy. True religion was this, to care for the fatherless and the widows. James 1, 27. And this is why Paul the Apostle gives such careful instructions on ministering to widows in 1 Timothy chapter 5. It had to be done correctly and fairly across the board, but by all means it had to be done. And the widows who circled this upper room were, were living testimonials of how God guided Tabitha in these things. This selfless seamstress from Joppa had carried these things out beautifully. Tabitha had personally made the coats and garments which draped over the shoulders of those in the room. And through most of history, we know that it's been painstaking to make clothing. And we don't know exactly how Tabitha did it, but we, we, we're certain that it involved a great deal of work and time. Often the materials were dyed from berries and other uh, color sources. And these things were not as bland as some of us might think. They often made clothing with multiple and bright colors. And these woven materials were sewn by hand. And Tabitha made things simply for the purpose of giving them away. And some people are still excellent at this avenue of kindness. They're continually making things and sewing clothes and dolls and quilts to give away. And this lady did it with a passion and determination. And the widows, as they mourned over the loss of this precious friend, brought these gifts with them now as a, as a final tribute to Tabitha, their dear friend. She made things for them. That's always a great gift, by the way. When you make something and put the time and effort and thought into making something for someone else. Remember Tara and I's um, first Christmas together a long time ago. I, was, um, I, I got connected with a, a, a lady who taught uh, porcelain doll making. I knew Tara loved porcelain dolls. So I took, uh, she was kind enough to give me private, a private session. And so I would go. And it was multiple weeks because you had to make it and form it and paint it and then let it dry. And, and uh, you put it in the, you know, oven or whatever it was called. And, uh, and, you know, so I had to continually make excuses to her as to why I was leaving the house and where I was going. 
And I worked on this over the course of, of several weeks in time to give this to her for Christmas. And so I made this doll, and, and um, I think I carved my initials in it, or to Tara with love, or Merry Christmas, or something in the, the back of the head under the, the wig. And it was awesome, by the way. I mean, it was a beautiful piece of work. Um, the problem is, you know, that was our first Christmas together, and ever since it's kind of been, you know. So I started way too high. But for that one season, I know several of you, I was visiting our friend Marvel, a dear woman in our church yesterday in the nursing home, and on her bed was a, a quilt that was made for her by... Uh, group of Sunday school kids from her former church and they had individual blocks in which they painted or wrote something and it was so dear and so precious to her, she keeps it with her. It's always a great gift. Thank God for those of you in this room, whether it's clothes or quilts or food or cards, that you take the time and effort and thought to put into that and what a tremendous blessing that is. Don't ever underestimate your ministry in those ways. Her deeds, what an example. Secondly, her death in verses 37 to 39. Again, it says, about that time she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. So eventually, Tabitha went the way of all human flesh, and she died. We don't know the cause of the death, it was most likely a natural event, natural causes. But a lot of people that day had their heart chipped away when she died. The mourning over her was widespread and sincere. Tabitha may have been a, a single or a widow herself, but still she did not lack for anybody to take care of her body. In all probability, her friends responded to the task. They prepared her body for the funeral. Most Jewish families tried to adhere to certain guidelines concerning funerals. Embalming was almost unheard of. Perhaps Jacob and Joseph in the Old Testament were exceptions. Cremation was practiced in some nations but rejected by the Jews. The body was usually washed and it was wrapped in linen and perfume. The body was usually buried the same day the death occurred. Some groups still keep to this rule today. The body was often uh, placed in a cave or tomb and it was allowed to decompose. For a period of time, the bones were placed into an ossuary box, a, a place or receptacle for, for bones of the dead. And this container would be kept in a tomb or, or some other uh, suitable place. These were probably the plans for Tabitha's body. After she was cleansed and wrapped, she was placed in an upper chamber. And this chamber was usually either a, a secondary or, or a second story room or a room on the upstairs porch of the home. Friends would come to mourn and, and to pay their final respects. In some cases, professional mourners would even be hired. While this is all happening... Uh, the Christian community at Joppa heard that the Apostle Paul was nearby in the city of Lydda. And so when hearing that, they sent quickly for his help. I mean, they loved Tabitha greatly, and they wanted to assist her in any way possible. And Lydda was only about nine miles from Joppa, so the trip could be made in about half a day. So when did they send for Peter? I mean, it's, it's tough to tell in the sequence, but her friends may have started the trip while she was uh, still sick and fading. They loved her, and they believed in miracles. They also believed in special apostolic authority, like Peter could do something to restore her health. He would performed other miracles. He just got done performing one in the verses that just led up to our text in Acts 9, verses 32 to 35, where he healed a man named Aeneas, who'd been a paralytic for eight years. And it says in verse 35 that all those who lived there saw him and turned to the Lord. If nothing else, I'm sure they thought at least Peter could preside over the funeral. 
But sometime around when the party left to find Peter, Tabitha died. And those who had ministered to her were crushed. Just absolutely devastated. Their close and generous friend was gone. The weeping and preparing had begun. When the traveling group arrived at Lydda, they quickly found Peter and they pressed on him. The end of verse 38 says they urged him, please come at once. He had to come. They were pleading the case of a close friend. I mean, certainly God did not want her to die, they thought. Tabitha did too much good. She spread too much joy and too much hope. Peter, the apostle, was impressed with their care and their persistence, and he moved. He was moved by the emergency of the situation, and he left with them immediately. No time, there's no time for explanation. Time was short. And when he arrived at Joppa, Peter was taken directly to the upper chamber. With the trophies of Tabitha's goodness and her kindness uh, all around the room, Widows stood with coats and garments draped over their shoulders. These are the articles of clothing that Tabitha had made for the people that she loved. Her deeds, her death, and then thirdly, her deliverance. There's a miracle that's just about to happen. And I think it's worth just taking a pause on the story itself to talk about this thing called miracles. Uh, the Bible says that we should expect another season of miracles sometime in the future. Dramatic displays of supernatural activity, miraculous events which will signal the beginning of the end, the events described in the book of Revelation. And this suggests that the, the present era, the time after the apostles and before the great tribulation, we may see few miracles like that. But still, we don't rule out the possibility that God might choose to go against the laws of nature in a great display of his power and that he might actually accomplish this through a person or through many people, particularly in answer to prayer. And if so, in our discernment, we should look for at least four indications of authentic, miraculous work that this really is of the Lord all of which are reflected in miracle accounts involving Peter that we just looked at. So number one sign, that the Lord alone is glorified. The Lord alone is glorified, never a man or a woman. In contrast to a lot of what we see today, where these healing services become a show, with a man in a fancy suit and a big mansion, and a wealthy lifestyle. I don't always like to name names, but I don't know, why not? One of my favorites of these is a guy named Peter Popoff. I don't know if you've ever heard of Peter Popoff. I love that name for someone like this, Peter Popoff. Back in the 80s, uh, he was known for, he would stand up in front of a revival meeting or a healing service and and uh, he'd call out somebody in the, in the crowd. Kim Norlean? Is there a Kim Norlean in the room? Kim, you've got, a, you've got a bad back. You've had it since you were 11 years old. And you just saw the doctor and he, on last Tuesday and he gave you no hope. And, and then so the person in the audience is like, wow, this guy must have some kind of divine insight and ability that he's just able to know that about me. It was all about him. Then later to be found out and caught because he had a hidden earpiece in his ear through which his wife was communicating to him from the green room, reading off prayer cards that were filled out prior to the service. So he got in trouble and went away for a while, but then I just saw him again recently in a late night infomercial selling miracle spring water. Don't buy that. Don't buy that. Peter Popoff. 
If the supernatural activity exalts a person in any way, we can be rest assured that it is not of God. Number two, there's no showmanship. No showmanship. In the Bible, uh, miracles rarely have a large audience. And the display of divine power is quiet, and it's serene, and it's dignified, and it's personal. None of the Old Testament prophets, none of the apostles, not even Jesus himself ever used miracles to impress people or to entertain, to dazzle, or to draw a crowd. Number three, unbelievers are convinced to believe. That's the ultimate miracle, isn't it? All of us, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, who's uh, saved by the blood of Christ, and your hell is canceled, and your heaven is guaranteed because of what Christ has done for you, and your heart has been changed, that is the miracle of all miracles, and you are the product of that today. Unbelievers are convinced to believe. In both in Acts chapter 9, verse 42, and in the previous uh, miracle in verse 35, uh, it led to people believing in the Lord, which was the ultimate purpose of it all. God's miraculous activity gave people opportunity to believe. Many responded in faith. Others, they couldn't deny the divine activity, but they still willfully rejected it. But regardless, miracles reveal God's goodness and His power so that those far away from Him will believe and come to Him in saving faith. And then number four, biblical truth is validated. Biblical truth is validated. When God works a miracle, we don't have to hide behind our Bible or we don't have to hide our Bible behind our back to defend against critics. Miracles create opportunity to proclaim the truth of God boldly. Miracles removed doubt and then created a crisis of the will. So if someone witnesses a genuine, miraculous work of God and then reject Christ, the problem is with them in their own heart. Back to the story. When Peter got there, and assess the situation, he lost no time in going to work. Notice what he did, his first step in verse 40. The first step was to clear the room. Everybody, the mourners, the widows, they'd all have to leave. Peter learned from the master himself on this one. It's the same thing Jesus did when he raised Jairus' daughter, in Mark chapter 5. Contrast to what we see today where it's all about drawing a crowd. Peter, learning from Jesus, sent the crowd away. And Peter couldn't be expected to be an expert in resurrection, so he had to depend on what he had seen. And as usual, Peter should be credited with the courage and a rare quality that I like to call audacity. Peter had a lot of audacity. While he had no experience in the fine art of resurrection, he did have a healthy mixture of faith and daring. While others would still be thinking it over and analyzing it and chewing their fingernails, Peter just jumped in. He got on his knees and he prayed. And with great simplicity and direction, he said in the middle of verse 40, Tabitha, get up. Get up. No gimmicks. No tricks. He didn't even use a, a medium like dirt or a handkerchief. He didn't even need miracle spring water. Just on his knees, he prayed. And Tabitha, it's time to get up. Her eyes moved. Her eyes opened like a Venetian blind. A miracle happened. And Dorcas was alive. There may be no definite guidelines for miracles, but that doesn't diminish their reality. Some people in the Bible were healed because they had great faith. 
Others were healed because the administrator had great faith. Still others seemed to experience miracles only because God had faith and he acted because God is God and that his glory might be revealed. It would all be neat and tidy to set out these immovable laws which govern miracles. But nothing that neat and tidy really exists. The only dependable rule is that God is the great administrator. We are invited to ask, and he holds the prerogative to act or to withhold. And we trust him, believing that he knows what's best. You know, the story, and I really want to say this, because often as Christians in the church, particularly nowadays, with some of the rulings that have come down, thankfully, from the Supreme Court and things like that, we often get criticized that we hate women or don't respect women or want to suppress women. The story of Tabitha is a high tribute not only to her, but to women in general. There, there's several places where these accolades show up in the Bible. One of the most significant places in, is in Romans chapter 16. I love Romans 16. My favorite book in the Bible, if I could just pick one, is the book of Romans. It's a great uh, theological textbook that just gives us the whole story. And in, we have great big theological words in Romans like justification and sanctification and glorification and predestination and all of these words and concepts we all like to fight about and the denominations split over. But I love the book of Romans at the end because after all of that theology in the first 15 chapters, in chapter 16, the last chapter of the book, it all comes down to people. It is just a list of people serving in the church that the Apostle Paul thanks by name. Probably about between 25 and 30 names. Many of them women. Love after all the theology, it all comes down to people and thanking them for their service to the Lord. Some of them had been like quiet cargo ships in the night. Some had been bold and exercised leadership, but all had given excellent support. The Apostle Paul makes special mention of, of Phoebe in Romans 16.1, a Christian who lived in Centria. And Phoebe had those two superior, superior qualities for which Tabitha was praised. First, she was a believer who had just completely thrown in with Jesus. And second, she had this amazing generosity. Paul says Phoebe was a helper of many, including he, the apostle himself. That's the first mention of a woman deacon in the church. Talked about Stephen and, and Philip who were chosen as servants to care for the needs of the church from which we get the word deacon today. She, she was the first female version, a, a deaconess. And it describes both a service and an office. And certainly uh, they continued the noble Christian tradition of helping widows. But off, and often they were widows themselves but their ministry stretched well beyond the care of widows. And Paul and others were recipients of their kindness and their generosity. In Romans 16.3, we're also introduced to an active woman named Priscilla, whose husband was named Aquila. Their involvement in the gospel work had been so extensive that they risked their lives for the Apostle Paul. And they now have a church that regularly meets uh, in their home. Mary received a short but sincere notice in verse 6. She'd also worked hard for the cause of Christ. Paul also uh, can't forget to mention the mother of Rufus in verse 13. She'd been such a fine lady. And she was almost like Paul's mother. His own mother, he said. There may be other women uh, listed in this group uh, in Romans 16, some of their names are difficult to pick out. 
But just this sampling alone gives us a really good idea of the high esteem and high appreciation Paul held for women, and we as the church should too. From the early church, this whole modern debate over whether Paul, whether the early church, whether the church today hates women, doesn't care about women, should be silenced right here. Christ himself set an incredible example for the elevation of women. I mean, it's revolutionary. He included women among his personal friends. Mary Magdalene was a woman who had been possessed by seven demons. They had left her, and now she was a committed supporter of Christ. Mary contributed financially to Jesus' ministry in Galilee. She traveled with the group of disciples, as did Joanna and Susanna in the first three verses of Luke chapter 8. Her status as a woman did not deter Christ from befriending her and incorporating her into the work. A certain class of people were insulted by Jesus' companionship with women and the way that he involved them in his ministry. Some held extremely religious rules concerning women and what they were able to do or not do. But not everyone. And in some Jewish circles, women were given tremendous latitude heard of the Proverbs 31 woman in a beautiful, wonderful, complimentary way working alongside men in the work of the Lord. Mary of Bethany and her sister Martha, remember the story in Luke chapter 10, also played a considerable part in Christ's life. Their personalities were very different. Mary appeared to be a, a serious thinker who often took time to sit and listen and contemplate. Martha, her sister, was all strictly business. Busy hands. Jesus visited in their home and didn't allow himself to become upset when his critics couldn't understand why he would allow a woman like Mary to anoint him with expensive perfume. These were the more obvious women who ministered in Christ's life. Several others pop up in the scriptures now and then. Women have always taken a major responsibility in the presentation of the gospel. Tabitha was but one example of their excellence. Today, women, God bless you for your servant's heart, and for your partnership in the work of the gospel. Thank you for your love for people and your care for them. And many continue to live out the full extent of genuine service to Christ. And we're thankful. So let me just share this in clothing, closing as a word of application. And that's simply don't be ashamed of your gift. We're all gifted to serve in some way. Uh, don't be ashamed of yours or think it's any less important than anybody else's. We see here the value of servant evangelism. We all can share of our faith and we think um, sometimes uh, th th there's only one way to, to do it. There's only one style. Um, but there's different styles in Scripture. I mean... There's the confrontational style like Peter himself. There's the intellectual style like the Apostle Paul. There, there's the testimonial uh, uh, approach. A number of the people whom Jesus healed just shared of the difference that Christ has made in their life. There's the relational uh, style like, like Matthew, the tax collector, who on one occasion in the New Testament uh, threw a party and he invited some of his grubby tax collector friends to come so they could rub shoulders with Jesus and the other disciples and so spiritual conversations could happen. Then there's the invitational style, just, just inviting people. Invite people to church, invite people to a, a, a Christian concert or event. I, 
The woman at the well in John chapter 4 had a life-changing uh, encounter, exchange, conversation with Jesus. And at the end of it, knowing that she wasn't maybe quite ready to articulate the message herself, she simply goes back to her home village and she invites others to come and hear. And many of them did, and many of them were saved. So confrontational, intellectual, uh, relational, testimonial, invitational. But then there's this whole thing of servant evangelism where we share our faith and we demonstrate it with our action. I don't know of a better example of that in Scripture than Tabitha who serves and gives of themselves and people notice a difference because it's so countercultural. And they perhaps are led to ask the question, what is it about you that's different? And in those moments, we have the opportunity to say, I'm so glad you asked. Let me tell you about the, the Jesus that I love and serve. The one who motivates me and prompts me to do what I do. Your gift is valuable. Sure, God uses great preachers like Peter and Paul, but he also greatly uses those who have gifts of kindness like Tabitha. So rather than wishing you had other gifts, make good use of the gifts that God has given you. We thank God for women like Tabitha and all who are like her. Father, uh, we're thankful for the examples that you've given us in your word. Thank you for the examples that you've given us in our own lives, in people who serve and who give. They don't care about the limelight. They don't care about receiving any kind of credit. It's not about them, but they just serve. Lord, give us that heart. Give us a servant's heart, not just the action, but the, the attitude behind it. I mean, people can serve without a servant's heart. We can serve for the wrong motives. But Lord, I pray that you would give us both the right motive that would then lead to the right actions that we would serve with the heart of Christ. The one who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so as we come around the communion table, and we receive the elements, the, the wafer that symbolizes the, the body of Christ broken for us on that cross. The juice that symbolizes the blood of Christ that was shed for us on that cross. Lord, may we in our own lives be, be touched and ministered to. May we remember, for many of us, this is just kind of routine. We've been doing this a long time, month after month, year after year. But Lord, may there be something about today where you would prick our hearts and grab our attention and, and remind us in a fresh and powerful way that would move us as we reflect upon the servant-hearted sacrifice of our Lord. And may that prompt us, may that motivate us. May that move us toward giving of ourselves, laying ourselves down, coming after him by taking up our cross daily and following him in lives of servanthood. Because it's not about us. It's about you. And we serve about serving you and we serve you by serving others. So, Lord, guard us and guide us in these moments, I pray. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. I'm going to invite our stewards, our three stewards, to come forward. And they will, in a moment, serve you the elements of communion, both the wafer and the juice. It'll be two in one. So there's one cup uh, underneath the other. Uh, the, the bread, the wafers in the bottom, the juice on the top. And uh, we'll ask that once you receive them, that you hold them until all have been served. We'll regather here in the front, and one of the gentlemen will lead us in prayer. And then at my invitation, we'll partake together. You need not be a member of Tri-County Alliance Church in order to participate in the communion service. But we do ask that you be a member of the family of God through your personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he's made for you. And if you're uncertain about that, pray, don't, don't leave today uncertain. Um, the questions about the Christian life and how to receive Christ and how to be born again. Uh, I or any of these gentlemen would be glad to talk with you after the service or someone that you came with uh, today would be glad to talk with you. So God bless you as we receive in these moments. Lord, we just uh, come before you this morning, Lord, and thank you for the great price you paid for us at Calvary. Lord, for, the, for all the pain and agonies you went through. Lord, as we remind in your word, you are the bread of life. And no man can come unto the Father but through you. And Lord, uh, as we read in your word every day, Lord, the, the bread that fills our soul, our hearts, and our minds, may we never lose sight of that in Jesus' name. Amen.
On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and he broke it. He said, this bread represents my body broken for you. Take and eat and as often as you do so, do so in remembrance of me. Let's take and eat together and remember Jesus. Holy Father, as we take this cup that represents a new covenant, we remember your sacrifice, the blood you shed for many. We thank thank you for your salvation that keeps us from our path to hell. Thank you for saving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. On that same night, Jesus took the cup. He said, this cup represents uh, my blood shed for you. Take and drink as often as you do so. Do so in remembrance of me. Let's take and drink together and remember the Savior. As we close our service together, I'm going to invite the full worship team to come. And uh, we're going to sing of the greatness of our God. On the way out, uh, there will be a gentleman standing in the back uh, for, with an offering plate, and that's just for those of us who call this our church home, to give to what's called our benevolent offering. It's taken once a month um, in congruence with Communion Sunday, and that's just uh, funds that are managed by the church that help go toward people in our church or in our community who find themselves in a tough place uh, financially. So let's stand together uh, as we sing about the greatness of our God. you grateful for your presence. I hope you have a wonderful uh, holiday weekend as you celebrate together with those that you love. As you go, just a couple of quick things to remind you of. Next Sunday, July 10th, is a special Sunday. We'll be recognizing two couples who are hitting milestones uh, with 50 or 50 plus uh, wedding anniversaries. We'll have a little reception out in the lobby. We'll recognize them during the service. And they know who they are, and they're all in the room today. And we trust that they'll come back next week and uh, so we can celebrate with them. Chris and Jamie O'Dell, then the following weekend, will be with us. They're our wonderful and beloved uh, missionary partners in the land of Taiwan. And they'll be here together uh, July 15th. We welcome all of you here for family night. And there'll be an outdoor activity with lots of fun and food and great time with them. And then they'll be with us for the whole morning 
uh, on July 17th with a big TCA potluck bash uh, yeah. <laughs> to culminate all of that. So until we're together again, God bless you, we love you, and go serve your king. Thank you.